All right, well, this I think is wonderful. This video of uh, the Mars landing, absolutely worth checking out. You can see the thing go down. Yeah, converge. Velocity solution, 3.3 .3 meters per second. Altitude, 7.4 kilometers. Very nice. You get to watch it go down. You watch it uh, eject the parts that eject. And someplace around here, they have the, uh, the sky crane. There it is. That's the sky crane. That, that disturbance in the dust there. They're going to show it. Yep, there's the camera pointing up. So that little thing is above them at the other end of a rope, pulling them up so that the uh, engine that slows them down can be physically separated from the lander. And uh, that's the most dangerous spot, and it worked. So there goes the sky crane flying away to, I think, just crash somewhere, and uh, it's down there. So that was a very nice video. Anyway, uh, on the other hand, the Boeing 777 is in big trouble. And... Um, some of these have a picture of a passenger on the plane that could actually watch the engine catch fire out the window. Yeah, yeah, in color and good quality. So uh, Boeing has now grounded their planes because of this. Um, the engine just caught fire and failed, and, and nobody got hurt. They managed to land a thing, but still, that's, uh, that's bad PR. So that's another failure for Boeing. They've had quite a few failures in the last several years. Uh, this powerhouse VPN has a bunch of VPN servers all over the place, and they're all listening on some high-numbered UDP port, 20,811, and you can bounce traffic off them and amplify it. Does China also have a rover? I do not think so. There's three countries there now, China, the United States, and I think the United Arab Emirates, and we're the only one I think that's landing on Mars. The others are just flying by. But we're all there at the same time because it's the, uh, the best time to go to Mars. Uh, the orientation of the planets is such that uh, this is the time when you can arrive there with the minimum expenditure of fuel. So three nations launched uh, trips all at about the same time. So they've, uh, they say if you want to block this, there's two simple cures. If you don't like this powerhouse VPN being used to attack you with a DDoS attack, you could block all the powerhouse VPNs. IP addresses, but then you'd lose all the customers coming through the VPN. So what would be a whole lot better would be to just block this crazy port number because there shouldn't be any traffic coming on that port number of input. And yeah, uh, no, I think it's smaller than an SUV. I think they said it was like one ton. It's like a small car, the Mars rover. And it also has a little tiny uh, helicopter drone on it too, which is also flying around in the Martian air, which surprised me because there isn't much air. Only about 1% as much air as here, but somehow they can still fly a little tiny helicopter around. And this was kind of amazing. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates have founded this thing trying to reform math education by making it not racist, which is, there are things wrong with American math education, but I hadn't really thought of racism as being the problem. And so uh, this document somehow claims that uh, the way we teach math is racist, and we have to fix it on that ground. So that seems like a little strange complaint. But anyway, um, such is life. All right, we're up to 6.09. Maybe uh, see if there's anything else worth mentioning here. Um, thought this was kind of funny. The price of college is way out of control, but not at City College. You people are not having to go in debt to come here. That's one good thing about City College. You can't beat the price. And uh, apparently this walk-in clinic is working in San Francisco. If you're over 65, you can just show up and wait in line and get your shots right through February 23rd. Uh, the line can get long, so I guess you'd try to pick an unpopular time like early in the morning. But anyway, that sounds bloody awesome. You do not have to make an appointment or anything. So I'm just not old enough or I'd be there. Quite a few of my old friends are reluctant to get the vaccine, and which I, I argue with them to very little avail so far. But anyway. All right. So today we're here with 127. And this is, um, we're going to talk about how shell code is written. And then I'll demonstrate the most important project in the whole course, 202, which is really the summary of the whole thing. Are those RSS feeds? Uh, no, I've never used RSS feeds. I never understood what they were for. 
I just uh, pick these links, I read the news and save them one by one. I wrote my own PHP script to just harvest them. Yeah, some people liked RSS, but I never really, I never used it. And I think it's pretty much over now. Anyway, I should have the uh, slides here, and then I'll demonstrate this stuff mostly. All right, here we go. Good. Um, so, I updated this today, although it wasn't much update required. And uh, we're talking about how you write shellcode. So, we'll talk about uh, protection rings and syscalls, and what shellcode is, and then demonstrate some of the tools you use to make shellcode and examine the shellcode. So, system calls work like this. So the point of shellcode is um, you write it typically in assembler, and then you, it gets translated into hexadecimal machine language. And then the point is you're making a, uh, they call it the egg. You're making a little piece of code which you're going to inject into a system if you find a vulnerability. And so the goal is it has to be really small, and it has to avoid null bytes. Those are the main goals of it. And it does something very simple, but uh, all right. The main thing you have to do is you have to execute system calls. And this is really how all programs work. If you write Windows software, it's just a bunch of API calls to call part of the Windows operating system. Please open this file. Please print this on the screen. Please open a window. You know, that sort of thing. You just, and the same thing if you write something on Facebook. You're just making calls to the Facebook API over the internet to ask the Facebook system to do this or that. And it's the same thing in Linux. You're asking the kernel to do things with these system calls. And uh, anything that touches the hardware has to be done this way because the user land code you write does not have the ability to touch the hardware. So we talked about this before. The hardware supports four rings of protection, but we only use ring zero and ring three. Ring zero is kernel mode with complete control of the computer. And that's where the kernel runs, but it's not where any of the code you write runs unless you are writing kernel mode software like a device driver. Um, mo almost everything that we write and run is in ring three user mode. And the point of it is the user land code can run. And if there is an error in user mode, it does not crash the operating system. It, the operating system continues to be unaffected, so it can just print an error message and stop that one process and the other processes keep going. Whereas if you make a mistake in kernel mode, you typically crash the whole machine. So that's the uh, that's what we're going to do here. And so we have to learn how to call kernel mode routines from user land to get anything done. All right, and that's entering the protected mode here. Now, if you try to access kernel memory directly from user mode, you'll get an access exception. That's an error uh, saying you're trying to access memory that you're not allowed to access at your level of privilege. What you do is you make a syscall. Now, um, C, live C is the standard library from C, and you're going to write C code, which is what we're going to do in this class largely. And that you call these C functions, and the C functions just set up and perform syscalls. And so this, um, the point of using live C is it lets you write in a high level language C and gives you functions like malloc to allocate space on the heap. And uh, it's more convenient than writing assembly code to call the syscall directly although C is actually pretty close to assembler. But it's, a, it's considerably easier than assembler. But it's a lot closer to assembler than other languages like Visual Basic. So syscalls originally just used int 0x80. And as we'll see, there's several other ways to do a syscall, but they all do the same thing. So first you load the EAX register with the syscall number and then to tell it what function you're trying to perform. And there might be other parameters, in which case you'd put them in other registers. And then you execute int 80. And that switches the kernel to kernel mode and runs your function and then comes back. So this is how you request the kernel to please do something in kernel mode that you're not allowed to do, not allowed to do directly. So this, this integer in EAX determines uh, which call you're making. And if there are arguments, they're in these other registers. And you can even have more than six arguments. Then you put a pointer here to some kind of data structure that will have them all. But we're only going to do very simple syscalls that don't need any of that fancy stuff. So, all right, let's, I've got Debian 10 running in a local virtual machine here. Um, and uh, so if we look at exit, here's the C code to just do an exit. This is a kind of pointless program, but we're going to see how this runs. You include the standard libraries. Then you have a main function, and all that does is call exit of zero. 
so you compile it as 32-bit code, not 64-bit code. Put the output in E, and then when you run E, it's just going to come back. It doesn't do anything but just terminate normally and give you a new command prompt. So we're going to see what this does. And so let's disassemble it. So let me uh, do this here. Let's make this bigger and try to fit within my limits. OK, so um, let's go here. All right. So that was E, so I can cat E.C. There's that program, and I can run it with E, and it just comes back. So I can debug it with GDB minus Q E. Okay, and so now I can disassemble main. All right, so here's the assembly code that does this. It's going to um, prepare the stack and do various things, and then it's going to call this thing called exit. So now, so it all it does is prepare various ordinary boilerplate just to get the program loaded, and then call this function called exit. So now, so the main calls exit. Let's look at what exit does. Exit. Um, calls run exit handlers with underscores in front of it. Again, just doing boilerplate things, setting things up. So let's look at what's in run exit, ham exit handlers. There. All right, that's a big routine that goes on and on and on. And if I hit enter to load page after page of it, you'll see it eventually calls underscore exit. So this is all the overhead involving running a C program, but it's nothing very exciting. Disassemble underscore exit. And that one performs an int 80. And by the way, it also does this, which is the same thing as int 80. There are four different syntaxes used for syscalls, and this is one of the four. So this one is going to do a syscall to FC. FC is uh, the syscall number. And this one's going to do a syscall to 1. And then it's done. Then it halts. So this is the actual active ingredient after all that jazz. All the rest of it just set up uh, the environment. And this is the one that actually leaves with two different syscalls, an FC and a 1. All right. And here's, by the way, the four ways to do syscall, sysenter, syscall, int 80, and this call GS thing. They all do the same thing for all practical purposes. So here's the final function. Syscall 252 is exit group, which kills all threads. In case your program is multi-threaded, this program, of course, isn't really. But that's the general way you leave a C program, kills all the threads, and then kills the primary thread. So this is the orderly exit from a C program. All right, so if we want to write our own shellcode for this, we can, uh, the goal is to make simple, small code. And this is an important thing to know about shellcode. Now, we're not going to write much of our own shellcode in this class. There's a couple projects, one project where you do a little, but mostly we're going to use shellcode written by Metasploit because it works fine. But one thing to understand about shellcode is you saw those hundreds of lines of assembly code in C setting up this environment and doing all sorts of nice things like killing all the threads and not just the main thread. But shellcode, you throw away with all that extra stuff. You want to make it really small. Instead of having hundreds of lines of code, you want to make it just three or four lines of code, as small as you can make it. So you throw away all the unnecessary stuff, like dealing with situations that don't apply and error handling. So the thing about shellcode is, if anything goes wrong, it just crashes. When I started using Metasploit shellcode, I was very frustrated because if you, for example, do a reverse, reverse shell, that tries to phone home to an IP address, and the IP address is not listening, you won't see an error message. It will just crash. Because if anything goes wrong, it just dies. To make it small, all the error handling is missing. So you have to real get sort of used to that. All right. So if you, what we want to do is we want to call the sys exit syscall. And this is the second one, EAX equals 1. And there's an online Linux syscall reference that will show these. But the point is, EAX equals 1 is just the exit. And when it's done, EBX will be the return value, which is the 
uh, number. This was exit parentheses zero, so it'll return a zero, which we could check, although we're not gonna. So this is the simplest assembly code to do exit zero. You can write the assembly directly. You have a, uh, this is the main symbol showing where it's going to start. This is the text section, which we talked about before. The text section is the one that contains the executable machine language instructions. And there could have been a data section or something, but we're not going to use one. We're just going to have a text section, and it's going to have three commands. Put a 0 in EBX, put a 1 in EIX, and call int 80. That will execute a uh, an exit. Now, so you can assemble it with NASM, a common assembler. It doesn't come by default in Debian, so you have to install it. And this will create an object file. When you do NASM to format ELF32, that will compile it as 32-bit object code. And object code has to be linked to connect it to the libraries and such. And you do that with GCC. If it was C code, you could use GCC to compile it all the way from C down to executable code. But in this case, we're going to use a plain assembler followed by GCC just to do the linking. So it's going to take the object code and build an executable called exit shell code. And now if you run that, it will just return. It doesn't actually do anything. But inside, it does do the important thing for us. It calls a kernel module so we can see how that works. All right. So if you want to see what's in there, you can use obsdump, and we're going to use this quite a bit. So let me go back to my uh, window here. Let's get out of this assembler. And um, if I take a look here, I've got exit.asm. And there it is with just these three commands. And so I've got it compiled into exit shellcode. which just comes back. Now, obsdump will let you look inside compiled objects. And if you do a minus D, it will decompile, it will disassemble it and let you see the assembly code. So that would be exit shell code. OK. And it'll give me all the sections here scrolling by. And here's all these libraries. But the only thing I care about is this one here, main. That's the one that does a move EBX into zero, a zero into EBX. And by the way, notice that it's writing it in the other syntax, at and instead of Intel or whichever one it is. Now, that's why I always look for a constant value. It's moving this zero into EBX. OK, and then calling the int 80. And then there's a couple lines here that do nothing. I don't know why it bothers with them. So this is the code I wrote. And this is the bytes it compiles into. So it is five bytes for the first command. When I move a zero into EBX, the BB is moving to EBX, and this is the number to move in all 32 bits of zero. And this is all 32 bits of one, remember, in little endian. So the one comes first, and then the higher order bytes come later, and they're all zeros. So it takes me 12 bytes to encode this. And the problem is, as we're going to see, you typically want to insert this into a string variable. That's the most common thing, a buffer overflow. You have some input, like a password or something. And if you put a null byte in a string variable in ASCII, that terminates the string. So if I try to inject this shellcode, the only thing it's going to get is the BB and the first zero. Then it's going to quit reading the string, and all the rest of it is not going to go in. So this shellcode is no use because of those nulls. We have to write it more carefully to get rid of all these stupid zeros. And that is what we're going to do. So we're down to here. All right, by the way, you can test your shellcode a lot of ways. One simple way to do it is with this C code. And what you do is you define a variable, and you just put in the bytes. So here's the three commands, five bytes, five bytes, and two. And then you do this crazy stuff with a lot of parentheses and stars. And what this does, it defines a variable that is a pointer to a function. And then it calls it. And you just have to get these parentheses and stars in the right places. And you can do that. So this is C code. You can compile with normal compiler, and it will run your shell code. And that's one way to test shell code. So when you compile that thing and run it, it will just come back. So it doesn't crash or anything. There isn't an error. It just successfully calls the syscall for exit, which brings you back. All right. Now you can use strace to see when it runs. And we're going to do that 
So S trace on test exit. So let me go back to my demo. All right. So here, if I do, here's my C code. It was test exit dot C. So there it is. And the compiled version is this test exit that just comes back. And if you do S trace, this will watch all the system calls. Um, test underscore. There, okay. Um, all right, maybe I need the dot slash. Yep, okay. So this shows all the, the system calls. So the first thing it calls is exec VE. More about that later. Then it calls a bunch of other functions. Here's the one that makes a memory map to reserve a area of memory. And here it is reserving another area of memory. And notice there are permissions, like this is a denying write to that memory region. And then it makes some more memory regions, because as we're going to see when we go later, there's several memory regions in every program. And then it calls exit zero. So these are the system calls it made in order. And the only thing we really care about here is it ends up with exit zero. But in fact, the stuff in the middle is pretty interesting. And uh, as we go on with the course, you'll get more familiar with reading that stuff. All right, so that's the game. Um, so now we can talk about how to improve this shellcode. The problem with that stuff is you can't inject all those null bytes. They'll terminate your string. So we're going to try to write better assembly code that will uh, be compiled into binary machine code without zeros in it. So this instruction here has a 32-bit immediate constant of zero, which is four bytes of zero, so that's no good. But you can do this one. You can XOR EBX with EBX. And the XOR will bit by bit um, compare them with the XOR. And that means if there's any ones, it will XOR with a one and turn to zero. So this will turn the contents of EBX to zero without literally referring to the number zero. All right, so here's one. This one here has a 32-bit number of 1 in it that's going to put it EAX. And that's no good because it's got a bunch of nulls. But you could use the uh, things we mentioned in the assembly language lecture last time. You can move just the 8-bit number, 1, into just the lower 8 bits of the EAX register. And then you don't refer to all those 0 bits ahead of it. So those are ways to simplify those instructions. So here's the old one. Move EBX to 0 turns into XOR EBX with EBX. Move EAX to 1 turns into move AL 1. And these are perfectly legal assembly language instructions. And you can compile that the same way. And you get exit to shell code. And now, if you use objdump, you'll see that it is now only 6 bytes long instead of 12. And all the nulls are gone. This is XOR EBX with EBX. There's no zeros. Here's move a 1 into B0. And here's the int 80. So that's how, that's the general process of how you make shell code better. And as you can see, it's quite a lot of work. And that's why I use, we're going to use Metasploit to make most of our shell code. But this is what it's doing behind the scenes. And in Metasploit, you can also give it commands to dodge other characters because for many programs, you need to dodge other bytes in addition to null. Things like spaces and tabs and carriage returns also break input. And so you have to be able to make a list of forbidden characters. And Metasploit will automatically figure out how to rearrange the code to avoid all that. All right. So now, spawning a shell, we saw this if you looked at S trace. Um, it used exec VE. This is what you typically do. Um, so the exit just stops the program. And that's not very interesting. What we really want to do is open a shell, like a reverse shell, where it's going to start listening on a port or connect to a command and control server. And so uh, the simplest thing is to just open a new command prompt so we can see things. So generally, what you do is you write code in something like C, you compile it, then you disassemble. Then you clean up the assembly and replace the instructions to get rid of the nulls. And that's how you typically write this stuff. So fork and exec VE are how you create a new process in Linux. Um, to replace a running process where you terminate the one you're in and start a new one, that's exec VE, fork will, um, you can create, copy a running process and have a new one. So now there are two processes. So exec VE is the main thing you use. This executes the program pointed to in the file name. 
and causes the current program to stop and be replaced by that new program. So here's how you do it with C. You include this library that includes it. I think it's Unix standard functions. Then you have to fill in the variables this way, which is sort of screwy. You have to put in the same thing a few different times. But anyway, this will execute bin slash sh, which is a simple command line. So if you run this one, it gives you another command prompt inside there. It A different command prompt. This is bash. You may not know this, but there are various different shells in Linux. This is the bash shell, which prints the current working directory before every command. And this is the sh shell, which doesn't do that. That's how you can tell the difference. So this program launched a new process running the sh shell and terminated the original process. So now I'm down here. All right. So you just, you can see it works. So um, you can disassemble this and see how it works. And you see it calling exec ve. And the exec ve had three parameters. So you have three things you have to push. Um, you put something in ECX and EDX on the stack, and then you uh, load EAX, and then you call this function. So there are three different arguments in there. And uh, so if you disassemble it into machine code, you'll see it in fact puts up four parameters. Um, it moves something in EDX, ECX, EBX, and EAX, and then does the call. And this calls this location. And if you go to that location, it's um, showing you that it's just int 80. So it's a little more complicated call, but it is the same thing as the previous kind of syscall we've done. It just has more parameters to launch a new program. And so here's a, all right, these are different, another uh, list showing versions of syscall. Anyway, um, all right. And so here's the final assembly code that'll get translated. Looks kind of like this. And uh, you can end up with final shell code like this after you clean it up. See, there's no null bytes in it anymore. And now again, this is the raw shell code that has that effect. So we're not going to really write these complicated shell codes, but you should see how they work. And uh, that's all I wanted to do from the textbook today. So I'll just do a Kahoot. And then I want to demonstrate the most important project in the course, ED202. So I should have Kahoot's open over here, and I do. So this is 127.3. All right. And don't hear any sound. Oh, it's probably muted. Yep to stop my uh, videos from giving me trouble. I figured out how to set my browser to always mute everything. All right, looks like that's it. All right, what will convert executable code into assembly language?
All right, that's objdump. Takes a compiled executable program and lets you, with objdump minus D, you can see the assembly language that's inside there. All right, what's going to list all the system calls? S-Trace, good. All right, how do you get from user mode to kernel mode? What syscalls do? Good. All right, how do you convert assembly language into object code? Yep, that's NASM, does that, an assembler. All right. All right, what do you replace move AAX0 with in shellcode? Yep, you use XOR. Good. All right. And how do you put one in EAX in shellcode? You just moved the last eight bits. Good. So, all right, Sean, Abacus, I have to tell me who they are. We might have that from before, but I don't know if I've got it. And Lou, that looks, what the other two look like, real names. All right. Good. I'm going to stop.